The Other World, A Tale Told in Many Pieces. Piece 1. Coming by the Sea. The boy riding in his coconut coracle had been allowing his craft to drift along with the tide. He knows that all water leads to the other world, so he allows his craft to float uncaptained while he sharpens his daggers and hunts for signs in the stars up above. Tonight we see him stretched out on his back. Moon-kissed eyes are closed, but he would argue to the end of time that he's not asleep. A few moments before we arrived, he was scouring the sky in search of the blue star in the west. The fractured glint of sapphire marks his home in the heavens, and he likes to spot it twinkling at him in the evenings. This night, he found it quickly, and smiles to himself now in memory of it. He often competes with himself of the previous evening to see which can sight the star first. The sad truth is that if he loses the race, his heart hangs heavy, and he does not look at the star again until the next evening. Save for one glance, when the sun rises and wipes every star from the sky, I am certain he regrets his negligence at those times. For tonight, though, he is contented, and he is about to have a very pleasant surprise. Let us not spoil it for him. Perch yourselves up high next to that blue star, and watch, silent. The coconut shell is rocking now, not enough to capsize, but the boy's eyes are open, and he has sprung to his feet. This churning current breaks at the very edge of the other world, and the coracle captain's eyes are alight and watchful. Shall we blow these clouds aside, so the fair moon may shine some passage for the boy through the gloom? There now. He has sighted the golden sands, and we hear his weeping cry. He could lay back down again now. The coracle will quite happily find its own way there, but he has sighted the other world, and will not rest. Delighted. He strikes out for the shore, leaving the bobbing coconut coracle behind. Piece 2. A sight over the other world. When you dream, all sense of rules fall out of your head. Impossible wonders become clearer, brighter, within reach. For this reason, the other world is more alive at night. During the daylight hours, its inhabitants doze in the mists that no sun can fully penetrate. Few adventures appear during the day, and far fewer inhabitants would even chase one at that time. Instead, they snooze, they idle, and chatter away soft nothings until the moon rises. As soon as pale beams of light begin to tickle the mist into dispersing, a great ripple of glee shivers down every spine. Adventures pop up almost everywhere, out of holes in the ground, dropping from passing birds, emerging from the depths of wading pools. Everyone rouses to a light under the brilliant glow of their Lady of the Heavens. She is quite the treasure, brimming with romantic notions and a keen intellect. She entertains herself as she hangs over the other world, high in the deep, crisp, black skies. One may often be taken to wondering how lonely she must be up there, but she is forever beaming down at her friends below, so we put it from our mind for the moment. Her gown is dappled with gold, remnants from a long-ago dance spun with the sun itself. Her hair shimmers in beads of silver, flecked through with snippets of the dark open skies behind. Dreamy and delightful though she is, every evening she rises without fail at seven, save for weekends when all have an extra snooze until nine. Of course, none residing in the other world can be quite sure when the weekend will be, this decision naturally falls upon their moon to make. She is especially kind with her choices, you'll be pleased to hear. On the occasion when there has been a particularly large or lengthy adventure, she will often make the following day a weekend, so that all involved may get a proper rest. And always she makes sure to set a little early on the nights preceding a great adventure. Then all who take part may get a real rest. It is for these wonderful gestures that the Lady Luna has gained the unwavering friendship of all who reside in the other world, and she wholeheartedly deserves it. It is in the very nature of the other world to have a landscape which is a constant mix of every terrain you could imagine. Yet they all fit squashily together, not a seam is out of place. The first thing you will notice if you arrive, as most do, by the sea, is the striking difference between the waters you are used to and those of the other world. These ancient waves are the most beautiful, 
and clear all the way down to the sandy bottom, tingled with touches of turquoise. As you pull closer to the amber shore, chalky turtles scuttle down the beaches to join the merfolk in singing their welcome song. The welcoming chant has been known to bring glistening tears to the eyes of even the most frequent of visitors. A short trot along the beaches, and you will find yourself worming your way into a snug warren of caves hollowed out into rock and stone. Some are waders, largely soaked through with salt water, so that you must spend a good portion of your exploration with sodden knees. There is one which sits buried from view. Deep below the sands, the entrance to a vast cavern lined with jewels glints through the water, putting you at once in mind of a very coaxing invitation to a sumptuous party. Only at the lowest of low tides can you catch the cavern mouth, and you must dart faster than the wind itself, in and out in the blink of an eye. One glimpse, that is all, unless you wish to see yourself stuck and sunk out of sight, soon to be nothing but bones amid the trove of jewels. Past the gleaming sands, you reach the towering mountains. They stand like great meringue pyramids, each covered from top to toe in thick blankets of white snow. Between the tallest pair sits the frozen lake, always in perfect condition for ice skating, though patches can wear a little thin in the warmer climes. There are paths up and down to it from the mountains, they all vary in difficulty, each painstakingly tagged with a start marker at the base. Then more arrows are notched into rocks, and signs pointing you in every which way you could want to go. The more daring sometimes try their luck on the uncharted side of the mountain range. Armed with snow picks and lengths of rope, they determine to reach the summit by sunrise. So far, only two have succeeded. We cannot speak for the rock trolls, of course. They tend to keep to themselves. But if I were to wager, judging by their continual habit of running laps around any who climb beyond halfway point, a delightful cluster of seat-like boulders found almost exactly two-thirds of the way up the largest of the mountains. I would guess that the rock folk have seen the summit of each and every single mountain at least a dozen times. They only ever venture down from their homes in search of new flavours to try. Perhaps one day we will brave it and offer them something truly delicious in exchange for them showing us one of the tippy top of the mountain reaches. Beyond the mountains lies the jungle. Set in a deep gorge crouching at the mountain's feet, the jungle is ready, snarling at any who approach it. Growls follow you as you enter its depths and only cease once it is quite certain you mean it no harm. To describe the jungle is to describe its every inhabitant. None brutal, so to speak, all having a bark which is far worse than their bite. And at least, if they do attack, it is only after a lengthy period of debate, usually amongst a group of well over six friends. Personally, I put it down to the very heat of the place. Despite resting right alongside the frozen mountains, the jungle radiates a constant buzzing warmth. The pearly droplets which ooze from trees pant from vines and slip from leaves, are all far from cool. The soil, the pollen, the very jungle itself sizzles the blood. Ducking at last out of the tropical leaves, the path changes smoothly into boggy swampland. Bubbles ooze and pop for miles around. And the unwitting traveller may soon find themselves come a cropper in tangles of roots and vines dogging the muddy ground. The trees here seem to bow as you pass, quenching their thirst in the swamp before straightening up once more to watch you go. If you speak kindly to them, they may see you on your way, dragging thick roots out of the mud with a great slosh and pointing you in the direction you wish to go. Rudeness is never tolerated in more than one gulp on the other world. If you make it a recreational habit, you shall soon find that you no longer belong and the entire world seems to close in around you, squeezing you out until you are thrown back, tragically, to where you came from. Beware your tongue here. Clambering over gnarled brambles, thick and heavy, you continue on until you find flatter, drier ground. Here, you have reached the rich pine forest, as dense and wild as ever any was. Wrapped around the swamps and jungle leaves in a half-moon caress, these trees 
stand the tallest of all of the other world. To scale one all the way to the top of its height would take untold weeks, and they have a taunting habit of starting to grow once again, just as you think you're making progress. Perhaps their secrets are for their eyes alone. Their stubbornness has not dissuaded many who reside here from trying, naturally. Plenty of all varieties choose the pine forest to make their beds in. There are always sounds of banging and scraping in these trees. Nothing ever quite manages to sit still. The very idea of doing so for any great stretch of time would be cause for uproar and stomach-clutching laughter. No, indeed. Always a resident of the pine forest can be found with at least one tool in hand, each more often than not in the current middle of at least three projects at any one time. Walkways, rope bridges, and swinging step ladders run seemingly endless, high up amongst the branches. If you must fell a tree on the other world, you must be certain to use every single inch of it. Not one bit must be left to rot, and so it is here. Over time, many ladders have been replaced entirely with grand staircases, coiled up and up around the vast trunks, leading visitors into the lofty structures. All are built in the higgledy-piggledy manner, which is quite fitting for everyone involved. I do not believe any two homes, forges, stargazing ledges, classrooms or cafes are ever built quite the same. Slate is the trickiest thing to come by, but all desire it for their rooftops. There is an adventure to be had for any looking to claim just an armful of the stuff. Though, of course, it is all entirely useless until the smithies have knocked it into shape and the artisans have decorated them in painted designs. Having a house with a plain grey slated roof? Preposterous. The pine forest dwellers would rather sleep on the ground. The silliness of such an idea. Let us now turn our gaze to the Great Black Lake. It lays spread across the edge of the tallest trees far out of the mountain's reach. The chatter and noise from the pine forest does not make its way out here. In fact, if you venture out this way, you would note suddenly that there is very little sound at all, and upon further recollection, you would not be able to pinpoint exactly when everything became so very, very still. Still, too, are the waters of the Great Black Lake. We have chosen an ideal night. The swans are out, and they are dancing. They are most unusual creatures, as can be said of all who dwell in this enchanted realm. But the swans hold a particular sway. They are what could be described as somewhat human in shape and size. Standing at their fullest height, most of their number would reach over six feet. But they prefer to twist and curl in upon themselves, making most appear to only come up so high as your elbow. Each bending body is strewn with thick layers of feathers, covering chest down to ankles. Fingers and toes are webbed, but otherwise the arms and legs resemble something akin to man. It is in their faces where any hint of familiar humanity is lost. They do have mouths, noses and eyes, but the colours are off. Lips are lost in the skin, nostrils are elongated into beak-like shapes, and the eyes that stare as we peer ever closer are a rich, melancholy black. Waves of hair lift as they twirl, fanning out into points. Feathers cascade in sweeping turns, all so pale that as we watch them dance, it strikes us that we may well be in the presence of beautiful ghosts. Although coconuts are plentiful in the other world, no coracle will ever breach the waters of the Great Black Lake. This is not a fishing ground. Indeed, none has ever seen quite so much as a fly here. None knows what it is the swans eat, or whether they consider such things beneath them. Proud, noble creatures. The swans remain silent on that subject. Some have names and others either do not or deny our requests to know them. Many rarely speak. The few who do are all named, and though they keep in contact with the rest of the other world, it is always you who must come to them. For now, though, we shall leave the ghosts be. Through the forest of gigantic trees and out again, 
The land then moulds into thinner woodland, with glades and pools filled with flying fish. The air here is sweet and light. These trees bear fruit, although as each is born in the same yellowy pod, it is near impossible to tell what ye shall get before opening, making pleasantly surprising work for the scavengers. Perhaps one day you come across a pombery bush and rush home to share the rich purple syrup with your companions. The next evening you may come again to the same bush, only to discover very ripe bosbees. These are magnificent in pies, but are not too palatable when fresh. The best bet is to take as many pods as you can carry and find out later what a selection you chose. It can make for a lovely evening of betting, wagering and guessing before the answers are revealed. Laughter really is the music of this charming place. Deeper still, and into the cooler greenery, past the last of the fruiting trees, at the very heart lies the Lake of Mirrors. It is the smaller of the three lakes in the other world, but no less important for that. A placid expanse of water, no deeper than you or I would be if we were standing on our tiptoes. It is surrounded on all sides by a circlet, of foggy glass archways. Each mirror stands freely, twisting slightly, as soft young breezes chase one another, brushing past in their haste. Simply looking into an archway grants you no reflection. The only thing you would see is bright greyness stretching backwards into more murky grey. It is in this moment that we have the place in our thoughts that all the mirrors surrounding the chilly water have begun to glow.